Today we talk about classroom context, agency, and resilience. Hello and welcome to Teacher Learning Cast, episode number 30. Today is February 23rd, 2019. My name is Benjamin Sur, calling from beautiful Aguascalientes. Welcome, everybody. I'm Piri Herrera, also here in Aguascalientes, and uh, ready for one uh, Saturday in which is kind of uh, fresh here at the, I'm at right now at the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes. And, um, Joyful as always to see the people coming and going on Facebook transmission. We have an official transmission for this show, which is uh, going on in YouTube. And you can look for us also in Facebook, Teacher Learning Cast. Benjamin, good morning. Good morning, PD. Always great to get together on Saturday mornings to talk, uh, talk shop, as it were. And uh, this is a, a weekly broadcast that we conduct. Uh, via Hangouts, and of course, we are at the mercy sometimes of technology, so sometimes, uh, you know, this is a live show, so uh, we do try to edit the end. Usually, don't have to edit too much. Usually, uh, technology agrees with us, but sometimes things do happen, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through today's broadcast with uh, no problems. We're also uh, broadcasting through Periscope. There's many ways that you can participate with Teacher Learning Cast, and we try to keep uh, as or provide as many different options as possible but one I think one of the best ways is to go through uh, our Facebook page teacher learning cast where many of you join us each week which is great PD is uh, often fielding questions and seeing who uh, comes in and out of our uh, Facebook uh, stream there but we would love to have you uh, pop in and out of our live, live live broadcast we usually include the link in fact we did this week we include the live link in our Facebook page. So if you want to just join in, pop in, and say a few words, add to the conversation, this is uh, precisely why we do this broadcast, is to start the conversation and talk about relevant themes around education, around teaching and learning that we usually talk about face-to-face -face during, the, during the week right. as we are colleagues at the Universidad Autónoma de Aguascalientes. Yes, Ben, it's really interesting always to have conversations about what's going on in the classroom. We invite you to join us because, uh, as Ben says, this is pretty much the idea that we put out whatever uh, is happening in our classroom and share ideas about uh, any situation that may be uh, having an impact, an effective or non-effective impact in our classroom. And that's what it, this show is about. It is, and it's also about bringing in other uh, teachers in conversation. I, I'm really hoping this semester, you know, I've, I've been, uh, we talked a little bit about this in prior broadcasts, but this semester I'm teaching eighth semester te uh, thesis seminar, and uh, my students are working, in fact, probably at this precise moment, frantically trying to finish a literature review, but I'm hoping once things get uh, calmed down a little bit after they finish the uh, report that I'm, I can invite a few to discuss their research. Um, my students are really doing some, some good things this semester, and uh, hopefully we can get a few of them on. But certainly colleagues of ours that we come into contact, if you want to join us, do let us know uh, if you hear a recording and want to reach out during the week, or again, if you just want to pop in live, that's fine. This is a very informal conversation, even though PD and I try to put some notes together each week to uh, decide what we're going to talk about. We are certainly open to not only discussing what we're uh, dealing with now, but if you pop in and want to talk about something else, that's that's fine too. The The point is that we want to extend this to others who have a point of view and hopefully a point of view that's different than ours. Maybe you don't yeah, agree with what we say. That's, that's fine too. So, Pity, today we wanted to... Uh, Talk about this idea of context, and we we were talking this week about uh, some of your pre-service English language teachers uh, about this idea of context and and how it can really mean different things, but that it can it it's, tends to be something a little bit more specific in your context. 
Could you kind of uh, lay the idea of context and how you deal with this this concept in terms of tutoring pre-service English language teachers? Yes, Ben. Uh, the thing is that I work in the practical strand. This is where teachers in training are uh, actually starting their teaching, uh, their, their teaching practice. Uh, many of them is the first time they teach amongst themselves in simulated classes. But I also teach uh, higher semesters in which they are actually assisting teachers. And, uh, and not, it's not the case of this semester that I'm teaching the, the ones that are already in full practice, in charge and responsible for a whole group. But uh, I do, I'm, I'm, I am working with um, my students in first attempt to teach among themselves, which is teaching worship and assisting teachers. That's, that means going to a, a live class, a real class with real students uh, during the week and having the opportunity to teach segments uh, of around 20 minutes with them. And, um, and the whole point in this is to be reflecting and analyzing what happens in uh, the classroom level, the happenings, the situations, and the effectiveness and non-effectiveness of whatever they plan when they teach. So that's pretty much a, a big, 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 wide, wide context about, uh, about what's going on. There are many uh, details that may be needed in order to do a deeper analysis, but I think it's enough just to have a clear picture of what we're talking about here. Now, my concern with my students in this case uh, focuses on the idea of planning. Uh, right now, it leads me to, to be a, a trainer that, um, takes as an, an, as an essential part and main aspect of the class, of the process of training, planning. It's something which is sometimes difficult because the students are not used to it. They are used to doing homeworks. And, uh, and sometimes the connotation they bring from a long life or uh, formation in education, uh, the connotation of homework is something difficult, is something hard, is something boring. Is something I have to do, but I don't want to do. So this uh, this is something that they carry. That's a, 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 a um, huge luggage that they carry in the in their backs from the whole life of uh, doing this kind of uh, homeworks. And uh, it's a whole other topic. It's a different topic to talk about them and to talk about the relevance, the the pertinence that they that it has in classes, but we're not going to talk about right now that just for the sake of understanding that it's sometimes very difficult for them to get used to planning because uh, they see it as a horrible task. <laughs> um, maybe I'm being too severe in the concept of, uh, of they take it like horrible, but yeah, it's pretty much uh, the way I can put it in general. Now, some of them love doing material, preparing material, thinking about the activities. Uh, so don't get me wrong in that sense. But my point is that they focus too much on the idea of the activities themselves. Uh, they, they enjoy certain type of classes. Uh, they like certain kind of classes they have. So sometimes that's the way they go, or that's the path they follow in order to plan. Uh, but they base on the activities. They think uh, they like the activities of a class and they think about an activity and they start all their planning based on first thinking about the activity, which um, I'm not, uh, I don't disagree with it, but I think it's, uh, it's sometimes really, it, it makes the job harder when you focus on an activity and you leave uh, for later the language that is going to be used in the classroom, the function of it, and the context, which is pretty much uh, what I, uh, work with them during all semesters at different levels and uh, and and I keep on going about this uh, idea of putting the base of the levels of uh, uh, there's an article I use a lot from Barefoot Teacher website and they call it the levels of language in the classroom which is focused on the form that would be the language topic the function of that form and the context uh, of the language. So pretty much this is the general idea about contextualization. Anything so far, Ben, you wanna add there? Or yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of things to it. And I, I know within your context, it's actually at least 
putting myself in the student's shoes, it's tr try to come up with a an activity. They're only going to be teaching 20 minutes because, like you said, that this this is their first contact oftentimes with uh, teaching in front of a group. And again, this group is, is actually their peers, their classmates, their, I guess, role playing, if you will. It's not a real class. If and But the idea here is to plan, I guess, a lesson that would typically last 50 minutes, but maybe uh, design an activity within that lesson. So things like context, things like all the language goals, uh, of course, are going to be specific to a certain uh, activity, but at a grander scale, at least at the lesson level, it's going to be of a class that might not be just about that one activity, that there's going to be other activities that lead up to it. There might be some other activities that are subsequent to that activity. Um, so my point here is I would assume that even for the learners, it's this idea of context, it makes it even a, a bigger challenge just to put the 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 activity itself within the context of the class within a maybe a linguistic or language or communicative context uh so that they you know to put all that together seems to be a challenge i don't know based on your experience how you you deal with with that aspect of it as this one activity might be 20 minutes and in, in design for the purposes of this course but how how does that relate to the the lesson itself that might extend, let's say, 50 minutes. Or yeah, that's, uh, there are a lot of pros and cons in, in this situation of uh, simulating classes for 50 minutes because there are a lot of aspects involved. Now, I'm just talking out here from my experience there, not really a research about it, so uh, I want to make that clear. But in my experience, uh, main aspects, not the only ones, but main aspects in influencing this is precisely this. It's only 50 minutes class. so. Um, how do they put themselves into the idea that it's part of a um, uh, bigger moment in the classroom, right? Which can be one hour, one hour and a half, two hours, or even four hours is right in a row in one session. And uh, so, so yes, this, this, this becomes a challenge because I have to understand which part of the class I'm taking and which are these 15 minutes. Another aspect that is really crucial in here is that students uh, already handle the language or at least they handle the language, they, they, can, uh, they know the language at the level of the classes they are teaching. So sometimes, um, frequently we suggest them uh, to, to use higher language, real language for the classmates so it becomes kind of a real class. But I don't go, I don't, I don't force it, I don't put my phone on it, on, on it because uh, sometimes this interferes uh, when they struggle with new topics and they actually have to prepare a lot in new topics, um, they are so concerned about the language, about knowing that it's something new even for themselves, uh, that they miss care or they do not attend many of the aspects they have to develop in this class, which is technical aspects about methodology, about teaching, about uh, dynamics in the classroom, about group control, about organization uh, and, and all the skills that, that they require and, and, and the focus is that they develop them in here. So I suggested, I, I, I strongly suggested there are certain students which I know they handle the language. So I, uh, I ask them as a requirement to have a higher level of, of topic in their classes. Right now, it just happened yesterday. I have two teachers teaching yesterday, which for the next class they are required to look for real language that it's something new for their classmates which implies them doing kind of a quick research amongst their classmates to see what what kind of topic they're going to bring so, okay pd i'm sorry if i could jump in because I, I this is interesting uh when you when you say that um you you made it a requirement that they choose some sort of authentic uh language because i'm thinking in terms of agency which is one of the topics that we're looking at right. uh, today the agency being the the freedom for students to make decisions towards their own learning. Uh -huh. What what in, in that particular case, what would they have done if you if you uh, wouldn't have given them that requirement? And and then more generally, how much flexibility or how much agency do your your teacher trainers have when designing this uh, this this uh, activity or this lesson 
the the regular thing is that they go for the easy thing they choose uh, vocabulary topics to teach simple vocabulary topics they some of them start with the alphabet or the colors or things like and i'm talking about simple not because those are simple topics because it becomes really simple to handle the language and their classmates who are simulating to be students already know uh, a lot about the topics they choose so they tend to choose easy topics now I give them freedom. This is uh, this is the second round we have in the semester, and they still have the freedom to choose uh, whatever they want. And uh, they come to me. We discuss when they have ideas. Sometimes they decide to change topics, or uh, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in that sense. Uh, the what we are focusing on is in certain uh, technical aspects of teaching. For example, in this round, the main focus is the use of voice, teachers' positions and movement in the classroom and um, and uh, body language. This is the main focus. So, aside that, uh, they already had an input session about it. They already have some ideas about what to do, what not to do in the classroom, according to theory, right? Because at the end, I always tell them, try whatever you want, right? And that's the way you can actually tell if it works or not, because sometimes what the theory sa says is not exactly what works in one context, right, in, in, in specific context. So uh, they have freedom in that sense, but once I see, for example, these two teachers from yesterday, they have already passed two classes. They already taught two topics, which were not uh, as basic as I told you, like the alphabet or the colors. But yes, they discuss things like adjectives, things like uh, simple present tense, uh, talking about the language, right? Uh, because uh, then we will jump into the context idea. Um, and uh, at this point, since they are, they have a good domain of the language, uh, they can handle the language very easily, and uh, and it becomes something uh, not that challenging in the sense of uh, the selection and preparation of the linguistic topic. Uh, that's when I ask them that for the next class to choose a more complex topic. Now I put it in that way, like uh, for I just I don't tell them like you compulsory have to do this, but I just tell them for next class I would like you to use a, a, a topic that you think is actually something that it's new for your classmates, or at least part of the aspects you select for the class to be new for your classmates. In the sense of, let's suppose I'm going to teach, uh, they decide to go through certain pattern of of an instructor with new vocabulary. Uh, and maybe it's something not that uh, complex, or maybe something at uh, intermediate levels or high base, uh, basic uh, high levels. But I suggest them, all right, integrate uh, a couple of, uh, let's say, vocabulary words or things that you actually know is not going to be something that common for your classmates. Uh, but I go through that uh, in that path. I tell them, I suggest, and when it's time for the class, uh, whatever they plan, it's uh, what I accept in that sense. I, I, I regularly, and, and I think I never ask them to change activities. I never ask them to act when they, when they plan something and we check their lesson plan. I mean, we review together the lesson plan. I just uh, uh, focus, first of all, on the idea for them to understand what they want from their students. So I go again through the idea of language topic, function of the language, context topic, and the specific example of what they want students to achieve, to say, to understand, to understand from a reading, or, or whatever the, the focus of the class is. And then when they, when we explore the activities, uh, we just have a, a, I read the lesson plan and I listen to them what they have to do. I just make sure they actually thought about the process in the classroom by asking them about um, things like, for example, if they have in the lesson plan something like given instructions, I just ask them how you're going to give the instructions and and um, just to see that they actually are thinking about the processes. Am I going to show a flashcard and I'm going to give the instruction? I'm going to say something, I'm going to wait for them to do it. Am I going to say it and I'm going to show how to how it's done, how many steps I'm mentioning and how many things I'm doing at which moment. So that's what I make sure of. But the main base in here, and that was uh, the idea of talking about this, um, uh, this topic about context, is that uh, the regular thing that I've seen in themselves and also in many teachers in my experience as a student also is that uh, we go through classes or, or many teachers go through classes focusing on the language topic uh, let's say to put a, a case in point they focus on 
the use of used to in past. And they focus on that idea and then whatever they bring as examples, uh, it's whatever comes out of their minds, whether planned or, in, or, or impromptu is done in the classroom, it's something that it, that it just comes from their mind from whatever they can think at the, at the moment. So uh, it's, it's like what you see in pure grammar books, examples of practice in which each item that, they, that you have to, to respond as a practice, each item has a whole different connotation and a whole different story and a whole different context, which uh, leads the activities to be focused purely on the grammar structure, on the form itself, with no major meaning, talking about meaning, uh, meaningful learning, uh, application of the language, the level of uh, real application, and the use of a context, which in my case, I think, um, gives the students a better sense of what the, uh, how the language is used, or that exactly form is used in real life. Uh, am I making myself clear so far? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, the because uh, some other questions are coming to mind because I'm thinking yeah. in terms of the students of your uh, teacher trainers, and so right. I'm thinking about when I hear context, I'm wondering how much of a discussion that you get into with your teacher trainers about the linguistic context that is the language situation of their their learners and how they present that. I'm thinking like the the relationship between the speakers, you know, I'm thinking about some sort of uh, communicative activity that's going on in their, you know, their 20 minute activity where the the language context seems would need to be addressed, right? And is it formal language, informal language? What's the relationship between the speakers? And what's the, basically all the information about, uh, about any situation except for the actual communication. How much of that comes into your discussion? And again, I know this is, you know, uh, their first semester a lot of times in front of a group, but at what point, how much can you get into, or how deep can you get into that conversation with your uh, teacher trainers about mm, the context of the language environment that their students right. are, are participating in? Right. Um there are, I, I'm sensing here a distinction on two, two aspects. One is the actual context of the students they do have in front. Uh, knowing them, knowing uh, uh, how much they know about the language, uh, knowing their background, knowing what they may like, what they may not like, that would be one idea of the context. But here, what I'm talking about here also is, and that may be exactly what you're asking, is the situational context in which in which the language that is going to be taught that day might be used in real life. And that's the discussion. Uh, how much do we discuss about that? Well, it's been uh, four weeks, five weeks of classes. I've been talking about that every single day with all my classes, not just teaching worship, all of my classes. Every single day, there's something related to uh, going to the basics and asking them again when they have a question about when they have a situation about what they're planning or what they, what is going to happen. When I have students that are already working and they have issues in their classroom, things that they have to deal with that become sometimes are really serious, and they bring up questions about that. What can I do with this situation? I have a kid like this, or I I'm teaching private classes and the situation is this, and I'm struggling with this idea. I always go back, I always start with the basics. Uh, what was the situation in, in which this happened? In, uh, give me an example of, of the situation you are dealing with. And once I have the example of the situation, I ask them, so what was the different dimensions for your class in that moment? The dimensions of what was the language topic? What was the function of it that you were intending to, to have? And what was the context that you were using in the classroom? And I always go through that idea just to have a picture of what is the teacher exactly asking the students to do. Because most of the time, the situation is uh, created by what the teacher is asking the students to do. <laughs> uh, so if you explore the idea of, uh, of the context and, uh, and how deep you get into it, 
I take it simple. I go through the idea of uh, just answer WH questions: when, who, where, what, what for, <laughs> and um, and the extra element that I that I tell them is this idea of the when, who, where, what, and what for is what has to motivate your students to get into using the language for a purpose whether simulated whether you are bringing it into the classroom whether real uh but that's what exactly gives them the motivation to share about themselves because sometimes that's another thing right um, i mean and it's all about the same about the context most of the time the context is and this is what i've been discussing this week with with many of them the context is me the teacher asking my student about their likes me the teacher asking my students about their favorite food or one classmate talking to another classmate about their family members and and i think that's what we want we want them to talk about themselves but the point is are all your classes based on students talking in class about their personal lives or their experiences in life is that enough is that a motivate uh, is that uh, 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 has a high rate of motivation or not? What can I do to raise it? How do I uh, put an example which is proper and contextualized before students actually talk about themselves? And then we go through the idea of bringing another context and changing a little bit the view and not exactly the teacher asking me what my favorite food is, is there something in my material, in my plan, in my preparation that motivates the students about the favorite food of someone else's or uh, in a different situation. What would you actually want to talk about your favorite food? What's the motivation to say that in class? And I remember an article, and I think I already mentioned that article about, uh, uh, about um, Steve, Stephen, I think is the name, uh, in which he mentions why would you answer a question that nobody has asked before why would you teach something and i put it at all levels all, all kind of classes you can think of why would you explain something in a class that students have not the curiosity to find out in language classes it would be what would you ask them to say something they actually are not motivated to say or they don't see the case of saying it it's just for the sake of practicing so you are only focusing on the linguistic topic on the structure on memorizing maybe the word and then in this and, and i think this is the major comment about this when you do this kind of classes with no context with no no idea of what to bring into the classroom to simulate a real life situation and and cover all of my activities or some of my activities or all of my examples under the umbrella of a well-defined context about the when who where what what for uh, this, if you don't do that, if you focus only on the language you are living, your actual learner of the language, the responsibility to understand when they face the real world, when do I use this? When do I use that? They are responsible to, to figure it out because they never had an actual practical example in contextualized situation and they just know that uh, the verb comes after the subject. And then there's an object, and I know a lot of verbs, I know a lot of subjects, a lot, I know a lot of a, a lot of objects, I know what they are, but I've never put them, I put them together senseless with no meaning. So that responsibility is left to the actual language learner when they face real life. That's my point of view, and that's why I focus a lot on context for classes. Yeah, I think the the tendency and I think this is a natural tendency for all teachers, but especially those who are participating uh, in programs like ours, uh, where they're, they're pre-service, in many cases, pre-service English language teachers and just uh, getting into the field and, and taking these courses, that they feel that it's all about them and yeah. not their students. We've talked a lot about this. And it's like when I'm being observed, I'm more conscious of, what I'm doing than what my students are doing. And I, I'm even curious, I haven't looked recently at the course description of this particular course that you're talking about today, but I'm wondering how much is in reference to the teacher trainer versus 
the learning environment or the learning design. And I wonder, just by changing the title of, uh, of a course from a practicum type of uh, description to a learning environment type of, you know, just shifting the perspective to say, okay, what can I do to facilitate and create and facilitate the learning that goes into any particular experience, how that would, you know, change that, that perspective. But this kind of leads into uh, a few concepts I wanted to talk about today, and I was uh, I have been reading this book, uh, Why They Can't Write, and this is by John Warner. And I, I'm just getting into the book, but I've already come across a lot of concepts that I think relate to agency, resilience, this idea of context, really what, uh, what we know about uh, basically any craft or any field that we're involved in. Of course, this book is related to writing specifically, but we can easily transfer a lot of the concepts here to other skills and other uh, domains. But one of the things I wanted to share with you, and they, the author talks about uh, doctors, and they, he talks also about uh, chefs, in that the idea of practice, and he breaks it down into four different primary dimensions, and he breaks it down as follows, knowledge, skills, habits of mind, and attitudes. Knowledge, skills, habits of mind, and attitudes. Oh, I and, like that. And he, he talks about, you know, doctors, for example. Of course, we expect a doctor to know something. So what does a doctor know? They need to know certain medicines and about diseases and things. For our teachers, it really relates to declarative knowledge, knowing what, uh, what a verb is and knowing different grammatical aspects uh, form, meaning, and use, mm -hmm. and knowing some sort of cultural background and having some c cultural knowledge of certain uh, aspects. They, we also have to n have some skill base. We have to be able to do certain things. So as teachers, of course, we need to be able to speak the language, and we need to be able to understand the language, and we, we need to have some writing skills. But the, the last two, habits of mind and attitudes, I think are really interesting. And what I'd like to talk more about today in this, within your context, PD, is looking at this idea of planning for class and this idea of context. But in terms of a ha habit of mind, and this author lists, gives some examples under, under this idea of habits of mind, where he includes the following, curiosity, the desire to know more about the world openness, having some sort of willingness to consider new ways of being and thinking of the world. And, and you know, I'm thinking, especially in your conversation, Spitty, probably this idea of being open to maybe try some authentic language where maybe they hadn't thought about it before. Um, have you found in your experience, because I, I, I've got some other aspects here I want to talk about, but I, I don't want to just provide the list here, but maybe we can dive in a few of these concepts as, as we go along. This idea of curiosity and openness, how does that come into your conversation and how is that uh, part of the development uh, through either this class that you're talking about today or maybe some other classes within the practicum strand? How, how does this um, you know, reveal itself in your day-to-day -day contact with your uh, pre-service and in-service language trainers? Well, trainers? first of all, there are different... Uh, different uh, terms and different categorizations which match what you are just mentioning. Uh, I normally talk about knowledge and skills, uh, knowledge, skills and attitudes, where I talk about attitudes and behaviors, which means character. And, but uh, for example, in the, in the program here in Aguascalientes, they are talking about uh, knowing the language, doing with the language, being with the language, and all of this goes pretty much to the same idea. But uh, that's what I was mentioning when you were, when you were uh, uh, saying the four terms habits of mind. I don't think I have put it that clearly in that term, like habits of mind, but I do think I've covered somehow this aspect in the, with the idea of motivation. When we talk about motivation, when we talk about uh, raising motivation for the teacher or for students, I think we're talking about the curiosity, the openness, and the different thoughts they have. Uh, the way we handle it is that it's during feedbacks or during reflection sessions, uh, I tend to ask a lot of questions to students and sometimes I make clear 
that some of the questions I'm asking, I do not have the answer. They do have to look for their own decisions to make in order to see what works in their context, in their classroom and their idea. And I think that sometimes raises curiosity and, uh, and enhances a little bit their, their will of listening to what I have to ask or sometimes to suggest and also raises the interest of looking for uh, different ways to do the thing. Let me put a case in point which may uh, also summarize many of the things you mentioned at the beginning. Last Tuesday, I had one of the new teachers having a nice class in which students had a lot of practice. They had a, a context uh, which, uh, which was proper. They, they, uh, they, they practiced a lot. They, used, they had a lot of exposure to the language in a context. And at the end, I was talking about the idea that this can be a review class if they know the language. This can be an actual first presentation class because they had a lot of exposure. Maybe it would take a little bit longer in a real class, right? Uh, which normally does. It takes a little bit longer. Maybe it would require from the teacher to go over the example more than two or three times or to pinpoint certain aspects of the example if it is the first presentation. But at the end, it was a class that it seems that it would work. And the first comment from the teacher was, I didn't like it because I don't feel that I taught anything. <laughs> and, I was, and then we started to work on this. And again, what you just mentioned, uh, the idea of the teacher being the center of the class and being the one that has to say and explain and clarify without anybody, with, without anybody asking before, presenting and structure an idea. And, uh, but I was going back to the curiosity and openness. My comment in there was that, so why did you decide to do it this way? And uh, at the end, the thing is that with the comments we've been discussing in feedback sessions, which are, which are group feedbacks, it's for the teacher of the day, but it's a group feedback and idea and everybody pays attention to what it is. I brought the students from higher semesters to talk to them. I've shown them videos of examples of different classes which actually are, are, are having an effectiveness, a good effectiveness in, in, in the classroom. I've given them some suggestions, some ideas, and he is taking the advice. Uh, not convinced because he felt like he didn't talk. But he takes the advice and then once we go through the feedback, my job in there is to make him aware that it's actually something that is working and it's totally different. And my next step with this teacher is for his next class to start from how he felt in the previous class, why he decided to do that. Did he already watch his video teaching and analyze how effective it was in order to raise his curiosity and openness? And I think it's the same that he has to do with his students when he brings a class like this with a proper real context. Maybe at the end it becomes simulated in the class, but it's something from real life he brings and raises curiosity and openness. And I think this aspect that you mentioned, habits of mind, it's something I'm going to take, analyze, and see if I go through it more specifically with them. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to list the provide the list here of what they uh, consider all under the category of habits of mind. And books have been written about this. So this is nothing new, but this is definitely, I think, uh, something that more of us, at least I try to think of more about eth about myself and uh, others that I are in contact with. But the list that they provide all under the, the category of habits of mind is curiosity, openness, engagement, creativity, persistence, responsibility, flexibility, and metacognition. So when we're looking at this idea of habits of mind, how do, how do we think and what do we value? Mm -hmm. And we think about these ideas of habits of mind and, you know, resilience is one of those, one of the topics here of today as well is, and, and I can certainly relate, especially with my students this semester, those are taking thesis seminar, trying to get through a research project, which is very demanding. It's, it's, it's not easy to, to write, you know, in any language. Uh, but also to conduct research and to provide ar an argument and, and the critical, all the critical thinking behind that project. 
uh, certainly habits of mind, I think comes, and even attitudes comes to mind and as I've, I think very relevant. This idea of persistence, just sticking to it, just trying to make a little bit of progress each day, each week and continue going through the daily grind and yeah. trying to improve, I think is just one of those things that uh, I don't know if we talk about it enough. And, you know, sometimes, you know, some days are easier than others as teachers and, and as students. But this idea of persistence and resilience and just continuing through the process and knowing that, you know, that there is a, a finish line, that I'm finish line in the sense that with school anyway, there's a deadline and you're going to get through it but that you have this idea that you're going to continue working and not get so discouraged that it ends up interfering, you know, with your, your development, I think is something that perhaps we don't talk enough about uh, with our students and, and just trying to, to get, have them have that habit of mind. It's for, it's for, it's easy, easy for us to say, Oh, have this, you know, attitude, have this habit of mind. It's another thing to actually have it. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, it's it's part of one's character, and a lot of times, and and there's going to be a lot of uh, influences on one's character that come into play. But, but the point here is, as teachers and as teacher trainers, I think this is a very important aspect. And even with our own students, I'm thinking with uh, teachers who are teaching uh, just general English courses. This idea, you know, learning a language is difficult, and so how do we motivate our students to continue through those? those times where they're frustrated or they're nervous or anxious or they suffer from anxiety and they're not willing or able to communicate, what do we do in those cases? I'm, good. I'm not in the mood today and that's it. How do you cope with that? Exa exactly, exactly. And so that's where these discussions come, come into play, uh, even metacognitive discussions about really knowing more about your own self and what works for yourself. We, I talk a lot uh, this semester about the importance of trying to dedicate and, and allow time for yourself. Turn off the cell phones, tell your friends and family that during these scheduled times throughout the week that you're going to need to have time for yourself to, to do this project, this project that takes hours and hours of work uh, to complete. And I think it's just a matter of really knowing yourself and knowing your situation and knowing that, yeah, if I have my phone on and it's right next to me, I'm going to be looking at it every five minutes, knowing that about yourself and then trying to do something about it so that maybe you, you know, turn it off and put it in the drawer somewhere for an hour. And, uh, you know, that those little things can, can make a big difference if you're willing to reflect enough on yourself about how to go about you know, uh, develop your own personal development. I'm thinking in the case here, PD, in your example where you talked with this student who tried something different, maybe he or she felt uncomfortable or felt that it was even a, a failure or wasn't a, a success when maybe in actuality it, it was, um, you know, that had to be, at, that had to be at play here. Some of these ideas of habits of mind. And, and I think it's just trying to make that explicit, certainly from a teacher trainer standpoint trying to make that explicit or part of the conversation or part of the reflection uh, right. so that so that they see that about themselves and that they kind of learn that you know that maybe trying new things trying uh you know sometimes it's worth the risk trying these things that maybe right. we haven't tried before and and with teachers who have a lot of experience it even i think becomes a greater challenge when you're trying to try something new that you've been doing maybe for years right? and be willing to say, well, this might fail, you know, this might not work out, but I'm willing to try it for the sake of learning something about myself and hopefully creating right. a, a better learning environment for my students. Let me, let me uh, jump in here to tell you something that may be a little bit harder. Uh, how do you do that when you actually understand that the teachers or the trainers you are dealing with or the teachers you are assisting are on the totally opposite end of it. They are burned out, they are tired, they don't want to uh, or, or they don't have the time or they don't want to or they don't do it because they are not used to it. 
to actually sit down, uh, have a complete idea of contextualization or a class in which students are the protagonist and everything uh, you try to tell them, you try to uh, focus them on, you, you, you want to, them to open their minds to new paths different from the ones they have had in, in many years in, in the system. I'm not generalizing for all teachers, right, or not the whole system, but uh, it's a tendency. I, I say it as a tendency that uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, teaching which is not considering precisely these habits of mind from the student himself or this motivation or this contextualization of teaching and they at the same time are facing the totally opposite with their tutors, with their trainers, with their teachers they are assisting. And it becomes hard for them to struggle with it. Because what attitude do you take towards it? You are telling me this, but then um, you are doing something different from what you're telling me. So I'll do what I say and not what I do. Or um, uh, how do I understand this if you cannot do it my, yourself, teacher, I mean, or trainer? Uh, how do I come into a class, set a context, a proper context for my student when the teacher that is with me and giving me the topic does not care about the context and the class is totally decontextualized and I'm going to jump in for 15 minutes and I'm going to create a context just for my 15 minutes and make, make students make a sense of it when the rest of the hour and a half is going to be pure grammar with the contextual decontextualized examples i mean this is a hard part for them yeah and this is where this screams personal learning network right and okay what i mean by this is you know there's some things we can control there's some things we can't control mm -hmm. and certainly in a we're you know our context we are in formal education right we have we work at an institution and we have a syllabus we have a certain amount of time to get things done, and that is within the the barriers or framework that we that we uh, work. But this idea of a personal learning network and being able to have the choice, the agency, the flexibility to actually connect to whomever they to whomever I want is is where this is at. So if I am looking at, of course, in my own experience i'm going to see examples of things that i think uh are helpful and i can learn from and i'm going to see some examples of things that uh, are not going to be helpful to me and i'm going to always make that distinction i'm going to have that uh you know in any case everybody experiences those types of things but if you have a personal learning network that you're aware of in fact everyone has a personal learning network it's a matter of how aware are you of that and how much uh, of your decision-making processes is, uh, is directed towards finding those who you can learn from, again, whether face-to-face -face or online, whether it's through social media, whether it's at your workplace, wherever it is that you are deliberately, intentionally going in and out of these relationships, working and learning and making decisions on connecting with those that you think that you can learn from. and and taking full advantage of that. And I don't think that this is any different from us as teacher trainers than our students who are learning and maybe just starting the university for the, uh, for the first semester. It's the same concept. You are choosing and you are creating your own personal learning network. You're cultivating a personal learning network for a specific purpose. And that specific purpose is to learn is to develop is to gain knowledge and skills and even these habits of mind learn from others who have these habits of mind that you want to have yourself and say wow that's a, that's a that's a good example i'm going to try to do that i'm going to try to think differently i'm going to try to be more open or think about different tools that i'm going to be using in my own classroom and 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 basically have this habit of mind of saying just because maybe one person that I have con I'm in contact with isn't doing things that I don't ap approve of or you know then you know then I'm not gonna that's enough for me to not change I mean that's a habit of mind that I think is, is something that we need to be open with with our students to say look they're you know 
this idea of being open is has a, as a benefit and you're the one that's going to benefit of course you're not going to agree with everyone that you come in, into contact with but that's not an excuse to say oh well why should i do something you know and so i think it's just a matter of having that discussion that awareness and that openness and being aware of your personal learning network those who uh, that you can be in contact with and this is where of, of course technology plays such a, a key role um, in getting into these online communities and right. connecting with other teachers and, and doing things that may be outside your normal workload but for a particular but you get a particular uh, you know benefit and joy out of doing that because you're either learning something or you're connecting with with others and you know if someone is not at the end of the day willing to just have that openness you know I mean of course we have people who are in the teaching field who don't like to teach <laughs> right, right. that's a reality so I'm gonna kind of put those cases off to the side because I mean what are you gonna do about that but if, if you have this idea mindset that you want to be the best uh, teacher or you want to improve you want to continue to find ways of being better communicators teachers uh, experts in your field that you have this idea and this openness to want to continue to to do better right and uh, we already discussed about Ken Robinson's ideas and one of the ones I like from him and that I took is that learning is not a model learning is interaction dialogue communication so you need to uh, go back and forth with uh, other people with your students with your colleagues and you need to have this network this interaction with the books with the websites with everybody else outside so you can actually picture yourself on what you're actually doing i, I say picture not compare i said picture yourself on what you are doing, what's your role. It may sound like uh, uh, I need to see what others are doing to compare myself. No, I'm not saying compare. I'm just saying picture yourself in the zine. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Am I uh, something that you said that I also took Ben from you is um, what value do I add to the situation, to the learning situation of my students? Uh, what's a different, I put it in different words to my students, like what's the difference between the book and myself that I'm saying it and in the book they're reading is that is that all is that the whole change so yes I totally agree with you I like this idea of the habits of mind I always talk about attitudes and behavior with my students and I think uh, this is going this is going to be one explicit aspect uh, in which you can enclose or or specify a little bit more when I discuss about motivation when I discuss about engagement from the students when I discuss about the context and the reason for actually using the language, I think it's it's part of the habits of mind. And uh, and I like the idea that this is not just about the learners of the language. It's about the teacher himself. And it's about me as a trainer. And it's about the whole network. Well, one of the things, and going back to the this book here, and, and there's a really interesting quote. Now, this is under the, the, the uh, attitudes uh, domain now so kind of to contrast that from the habits of mind under ha under attitudes he provides an example here I'm gonna read this this is really uh, interesting he says writing is difficult now he's talking about writing of course but we can say speaking and or any other type of skill but he says writing is difficult that it takes many drafts to realize a finished product and that you're never going to be as good as you wish Oh. And so this kind of talks about what you talked about earlier about this ideal self, right? Mm -hmm. We have this ideal self. We are also our current self. Right. And there's always a gap between our ideal self and our current self. Mm -hmm. that, that's what this makes me think of. And, and I can certainly relate to this quote, especially with writing. And I know if any of my students are listening that they can relate to this as well. Is we're never going to be as good as we want. That there's always this gap between the ideal self and the current self. We also have this other idea of the ought to self, that is, other perspectives of what we ought to be. But here, this having this attitude of, I guess, accepting would be, I'm not sure if that's the best word, but 
accepting or realizing that there is a gap and being comfortable with trying to close the gap, being comfortable with trying to reach toward a goal and enjoying the process. And that, that's what I try to articulate to my writing right. students. And it's hard. I, I know it because I've been there myself. But to to try to enjoy the, the process of going through, in this case, developing a literature review, going through revisions, accepting feedback and being open and not taking it personally and, and really just trying to be in the moment of where you're at in your own development with this idea that, well, if I keep working, eventually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be closing that gap or maybe not even closing the gap because this is one of those things where as you gain more knowledge and skills right that ideal self mm -hmm. that marker also changes for for many it's not like it's a it's an ideal self my my ideal self 10 years ago is a lot different than my ideal self now and so probably that gap doesn't close and it's just kind of you just move up the scale so to speak as you gain more knowledge and you know but the point here is that you realize the gap and you actually appreciate the gap and you act and you try to work and continue through that process without getting discouraged because i think many of us realize that there is a gap and we just give up say well we're never going to close it we're never going to end which is true you're never going to close the gap you're never going to completely close it because it moves but the idea is this and this relates to attitude right this is the attitude yeah. this is the um you know, forget about the knowledge and the skills. This is just a, a, a what one believes yeah. and what one values and says, you that know, I, this is where I'm at and I just want to be, want to be better. So that's yeah. something um, I think I, I wanted to bring that into our discussion because again, I, I just think we neglect sometimes these, these uh, discussions about attitudes and especially habits of mind. I really like, this idea of habits of mind, and I've, I'm going to try to get uh, get my hands on some some books on this, and maybe we can go dive further into it uh, in the future. This idea of habits of mind and bringing this into the English language learning context, teacher training context, what this means, because I think that we all can benefit from some of these uh, ideas, especially of openness and mm -hmm. and engagement creativity and, and engagement I think is really interesting too and especially with teacher trainers is having them and this is where the personal learning development I think can actually start is having this conversation where students are sharing amongst themselves and this seems like a no-brainer for uh, for a reflective classes like yours PD that you have students who are uh, you know, sharing their experiences and with uh, not only you as the tutor, but their their classmates. But oftentimes when we get into the field or we get into, you know, start working for a school, if that school doesn't have a culture of communicative learning and, co and cooperation, what happens? We start to teach in isolation. Mm -hmm. That's when the silos come up and we're, we're, we get in locked into our own uh, classroom and we lose contact with 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 others and if we don't take it upon ourselves and we're only reliant on the institution to make those connections for us right. we're we're working uh in alone basically and, and so that's not where we want to be exactly and we make a static something that it's not static <laughs> something that it's uh, not linear neither static as you mentioned, uh, it's uh, something that uh, raises, I think we discussed something similar when we talk about the flow with Chicks and Mihaly. It's not, it's not that you get into the flow and now you made it, I mean, and, and that's it. It's something that raises above you and, um, and changes constantly and raises you to, a, to higher and higher levels and that's idea. And when you do make it a study, when you get in close into your classroom, when you become linear and then you think you achieve uh, a style, a form, a pattern, and you start, f you start feeling too comfortable with it, uh, that's where a lot of issues start to come. And uh, I can think of as an example of this static situation, 
uh, the traditional resistance that there is when changes come in the institution. Because we've been working so long in the same way, then now that they're asking us to change anything for as minimal as it is, there's resistance from people. But this is a consequence of exactly the habits of mind of the organization. They became static, they became isolated somehow, they get together for the hangouts and the parties, but not for the exchange of work and the growth. I think that's when uh, all of these situations raise, and well, they become more important than the actual teaching and learning of students. Yeah. I think one of the takeaways from our discussion today, PD, as we kind of wrap up, um, they qu a quote from the same book, and I think this is a good uh, way to kind of summarize here what we're talking about. But it says, from the student standpoint, I love learning. I hate school. <laughs> and so I think the thing that I would ask those who are, are listening audience is, and our teacher trainers, our students, is when we're preparing class and we're trying to determine whether or not we're adding value, mm -hmm. assume that your students – and because this is the reality, they love learning. The problem is not that they don't want to learn, mm -hmm. right? The problem is perhaps the context with which they find themselves in where learning is expected. And so I think we need to keep that in mind and, and think about, well, okay, so it's not about me, the teacher. Mm -hmm. It's about our students. It's about yeah. what they are doing or not doing and what we can do to facilitate or create the environment, the experience. We have to create experiences. That's our job. How do we create experiences? Of course, we have some limitations because we're within a, an institution. We're not just out, you know, out and about. Um, but we can do a lot. Even if changes are coming from the institutional level, from the government level, yeah, okay, fine. We still have a lot that we can offer as educators to create the experience if we have the habit of mind, if we're open and flexible, persistent, and we have these ideas that we are sharing with, with others, that we're open to understanding our own personal learning network, that we are providing agency that students are, uh, they feel that they have some ownership in their own learning process. And that we allow that to happen. I mean, that, that's that's our, I think, one of our biggest responsibilities is making sure that we allow that to happen in a way that is uh, creative and productive for for our students. Yeah, I totally agree on that, Ben. I think it's a nice talk, and there's a lot to say. I Many ideas come to my mind right now. I would like to talk about all of them <laughs> with many of the things you said. I remember many of the talks we've had uh, when we discuss about some ideas from Jeremy Harmer, from Ken Robinson, from uh, the from the flow, from the, the um, uh, some of the topics you have mentioned before, uh, which in which we sometimes have uh, different points of view, but at the end it all makes sense with the idea of taking whatever it's uh, actually making sound in yourself and making you being aware of what you're actually doing outside and which path are you taking? Uh, and then you realize that sometimes you believe you are doing something in one way, but truly you are doing it in a different way. Or I mean, a lot a lot to say about this. Uh, I think we are not gonna have enough with one hour, but uh, we can keep on discussing about these kind of things later on in our shows. And uh, as always, I enjoy to have those talks with you. Absolutely, and I really want to uh, thank those who are uh, joining us live in Facebook. I know Petey's got the names that he... Right. Uh, Let me, he very quickly, I'd like to mention the names so they know we are taking them into account. David Angel Gutierrez, Alma Zaragoza, Emanuel Garcia Cabral, Elsa Collazo, Rafael Espinosa, Saray Jasso, Eddie Valdez, Christy Plasencia, Fanny Edith, Omar Adame, Miriam uh, Galvez, I guess is, Oh, uh, medium something, sorry. Uh, Michelle Delgado, Jonas Castro, uh, Angie Garay from Zacatecas, uh, Fernando Aguila, Pat Grounds, San Luis Potosí, greetings. Uh, nice that you join us today, Pat, for a while. I hope you find interesting our show. And Salma also joined us today. 
Yes, and again, we really want to reach out to all of you that uh, join us either through Facebook or through Periscope or also broadcasting there. Um, feel free to join in. Uh, this is not, uh, even if you, regardless of your English level, if even, you know, if you want to speak a little bit in Spanish, we try to keep this in English, but uh, the main thing is that you have a place to voice an opinion and ask questions and, and, and provide your own perspective about different topics that we're talking about. So again, feel free to join in. We always try to include the live link as well through Facebook. So if you're interested in joining and just coming in for a few minutes to say a few words, that is always appreciated and welcome for sure. So again, I want to thank everybody for watching and listening to our broadcast. This is a teacher learning cast. We broadcast every week, Saturday mornings usually and uh, talk about just about any topics related to education. We tend to focus on teacher uh, or English language teaching since that is our, our field, but many of the topics that we talk about uh, expand to general education as well. So, Pity, again, thank you very much for an informative talk. Enjoyed it as well, and uh, we'll see everyone in the next broadcast. Thank you, Ben. Keep on learning. <laughs>